Hey, hi, hello, everyone. It's your local man, Dead Bedspread, and I've been thinking about Pokemon crossbreeding. I took a look at the idea recently, and I really wanted to have another go at it. How would it work? Well, here are the basics. Egg groups are categories assigned to all Pokemon, which determine which Pokemon species are able to breed with one another. All Pokemon belong to one or two egg groups. Theoretically, in order for two different species of Pokemon to create a crossbreed, they must share both of their egg groups with one another. For example, Wismer and Mareep are both within the field and monster egg groups, so it's within reason that they could successfully crossbreed. Gibble and Shootle both have two egg groups. They both share the monster egg group, but their remaining egg groups, Dragon and Water 1, don't match, meaning that they wouldn't be able to crossbreed. Obviously, this mechanic for crossbreeding excludes any Pokemon that belongs to only a single egg group. Due to the already established breeding mechanics, each parent must be a male and female combo. Genderless Pokemon do have egg groups and are able to breed, however they can only do so with Ditto, so unfortunately, they don't count. In game, I imagine either parent would need to hold a species-specific item, similar to a Megastone, in order for the crossbreed to be successful. Otherwise, there'd be next to no limit on how many mixed species we could potentially end up with. And finally, I wanted each crossbreed species to have a name unique from their parents to reflect their own concept. For example, our Wismer and Mareep fusion isn't simply called Wisheep or Marismer, for instance. Their overall typing may change too, to better reflect their new concept. Shout out to Neckpunch for that big brain idea. I've had the idea for crossbreeds for a while now, and while I think it could be a cool feature to tie into the past and future theming of Scarlet and Violet, I really think that it could be introduced at any stage in the franchise. Regional variants are already new takes on old Pokemon. This is essentially that, but with some added pizzazz and alternate methods of obtaining. You wouldn't find these guys in the wild. Maybe you'd see another trainer using them and have to deduce which Pokemon to leave at the daycare in order to breed to obtain them. I genuinely think it would be a pretty cool addition to the franchise. And quickly, before we get started, today's video is sponsored by... My Patreon! If you'd like to help support me and see some exclusive behind the scenes content, including the list of all the Pokemon that share two matching egg groups that I used for this video, please consider checking it out. With that out of the way, let's begin. First up, let's take a look at a potential crossbreed of Sveal and Ice Q. A seal penguin? No, 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 not quite. Both are ice type, either completely or partially, but there's definitely something more to this. Ice Q is an ice cube for a head, quite literally called its ice face form, which when it takes damage from a physical attack will shatter, changing into its noise face form. Nice. Regardless of what you think of this chicken, I feel like taking the gimmick of Ice Q and just slapping it onto another Pokemon would take something away. So let's look at this from another angle. Sveal is quite literally a ball shaped seal. So, what if instead of just combining the species into an avian mammalian hybrid, we combine the concept? Ball seal, ice cube penguin, ice cube, ice, icebergs, seals climb on icebergs, seals swim in water, ice floats on water, floating, ice cube, seal. Hey! The ice water type Papini floats in the ocean, using its underside flippers and tail to traverse across the water's surface. Incredibly buoyant, they are not great divers, however their skin is incredibly durable to any subaquatic attackers. They can usually be found chilling out on top of icebergs, or perhaps something that looks like an iceberg. But how do they get up there? I'll get to it. Seal's main method of locomotion is rolling, so I think it'd be both funny and cute if Papini moved in a similar way to the tox boxes from Mario. Not quite rolling, but it's trying. After reaching level 30, Papini evolves into Seasicle. Previously an ice cube, its body is streamlined into an icicle, giving it much more speed in the water. It's not very good at turning, however. It's able to waddle upright, having back flippers strong enough to support its lanky body. Perhaps it can use this newfound dexterity to pick up the juvenile Papini. But to put them where? Well, at level 45, Seasicle reaches its final form, Rymungus. Icebergs in real life are way thick under the water surface, and similar to the first stage, they are also inept divers. Their undercarriage is very craggy and segmented, deterring any underwater attackers. Rymungus's icy hide is stronger than steel, and on top of that, they're able to form a thick layer of icy armor. Their long, rigid neck also allows them to ferry a number of Papini, who are helped onto its back by Seasicle, keeping them safe to rest. Ah, the circle of life. Or cube of life, I don't know. What seals the deal, and with a little added twist of home, was that last year, a walrus supposedly took a nap on an iceberg, which drifted all the way from the Arctic to Southern Ireland. I'd like to imagine Raimungus ferrying the young Papini, just allowing themselves to be taken wherever by the ocean's current, assisted by Seasicle, of course, exploring the world at their own leisurely pace. 
much, much bigger than Walrein, Raimungus is also based off of an elephant seal, which as you could imagine just from the name alone, are much, much larger than walruses. With that said, its tusks aren't really tusks, they're just part of its icy covering, and can be broken off with enough force. They regenerate quickly though, so no worries for a pinniped friend. A walrus iceberg though, you can almost say it's a... Wahlberg. Yo, what's up, Maki? Pa! When I was originally coming up with the concept for crossbreeding, one of the earliest combinations that caught my eye was between the Corfish and Clauncher lines. Think about it. Both of these mons are cool, cranky-looking crustaceans with colossal claws. Well, except for Crawdont. They're actually cranky. The guy's a bastard. They're both within the Water 1 and Water 3 egg groups. Side note, water is the only category to have three separate egg groups. Water 1 being mostly terrestrial animals, Water 2 being mostly fish, and Water 3 being mostly aquatic vertebrates. Just for the few of you who are confused. Another interesting fact I learned is that many crustacean Pokémon can in fact lose their claws, usually through battle, and when they do so, people will eat them. The claws, I mean, not the Pokémon. There exist Pokédex entries about Crabrawler and Clauncher's line having delicious claw meat, whereas Crawdon's meat is apparently nasty and stinky. Uh-oh, stinky! So, if Clawitzer has the ability to shoot using its claw, and the innards of Crawdon's claws are apparently disgusting, I mean, that's just gunshot waiting to happen, right? Globster is a water poison type, sporting two large claws that are constantly producing a disgusting substance within. They're able to launch this ooze with phenomenal precision, and unlike Clauncher, they got both claws to work with. Their tails curve up and over their heads to protect themselves from any opposing projectiles by either swatting them away or hunkering down and covering their eyes. It's a lobster that shoots poison globs. Globster. And before anyone jumps in the comments saying that the parent species aren't based off lobsters, Crawdont might be named after a crawdad, but it's very lobsterish, down to its size and temperament. And Clawitzer is clearly a pistol shrimp, but its bluishness might be a reference to mutated lobsters. You know, the blue ones. So yeah, lobster child. Perhaps being born into this world and seeing the claws of other similar species being eaten. Maybe this angers Globster. Maybe it ignites a rage within its heart and its claws. Literally. I don't think it'd be that much of a stretch for the toxic substance within their claws to be as flammable as it is smelly. Or maybe to ignite them you just chuck a firestone at it. Once exposed, Globster evolves into Ooclaw, increasing in size, becoming more volatile, foaming at the mouth, and having its water poison typing changed to water fire. Because it shoots things. It fires with its claws. It's genius, I know. It could have corrosion for its ability in order to keep its poison type origin intact. Crawdont already has a nasty attitude, so now just imagine if it had guns for hands. With their face protected by their massive claws and bubble beard, Ookclaw can roll back onto their massive tail, protecting their otherwise sensitive belly, which also ends up giving it the appearance that it's riding a horse, because it's an outlaw that can shoot with its claws. I wanted to be a cowboy, baby. I wanted to be a cowboy. I'm still debating something when it comes to these crossbreeds. I originally intended for them to be their own species, being able to be released into the wild and maybe start up their own populations, like how Raimungus travels the ocean blue with its family. However, then I realized that hybrid animals in real life are unable to breed. In order for more of these kinds of animals to exist, both the parent species would have to create another, as the offspring are infertile. So here's what I'm asking. Do you think crossbreed Pokemon should be able to breed themselves? Or should they have to be bred exclusively from their parent species, resulting in them being in the No Eggs Discovered egg group, similarly to legendaries and other weird Pokemon? Leave a comment, let me know. <sighs> now, before I reveal this next fake man, I just want to preface this by saying that some Pokemon have pretty dark origins, but ultimately still have the ability and appearance to remain as a friend in game. Even the Chimney Sweep Phantom variant I did last year has nothing on what I'm about to show you. I won't be displaying any disturbing images or anything like that, but I'll still be talking about what I found. Right. Checking out the Field and Fairy Egg groups, which mostly contains Pikachu and around half of its clones, I originally had an idea to do something with Snubble and Skiddy. Some sort of ultra-domesticated cat-dog abomination. The ultimate commercial pay, you know? Then I realized something. Mawile is also in this group. For those who don't know, Mawile is based off of a yokai called the Two-Mouthed Woman. Having one mouth where humans normally do, and another, more ravenous mouth slap bang on the back of her head, beneath her hair. What is Mawile's big jaw if not resembling a ponytail? It was a no-brainer that I had to use it as one of the parent species. But what to pair it with? Togedemaru is spiky, like Mawile's teeth. Marpiko has zigzag patterns, which could maybe open up to reveal hidden mouths, 
But there's something missing, you know? That je ne sais quoi that makes a fake man. Snubble and Granbull are two Pokemon that I regularly forget about. Like, they just exist. Granbull is kind of just a purple cartoon dog, in my opinion. Corporate needs you to find the differences between this picture and this picture. They're the same picture. With that being said, what is one of the main reasons that someone might be scared of a dog? They bite things. Mawel and Granbull both have big, bitey mouths. This is a good place to start. And it only went downhill from here. So, multiple-headed dogs are a very well-known thing in mythology. We all know Cerberus, the three-headed dog. And there's all of those fan creations for Houndoom evolutions, after Mega Houndoom disappointed the nation by not having three heads. Mawile only has two mouths, not counting Mega Evolutions, because those might as well be mythed themselves nowadays. And because of that, it seemed a bit, I don't know, disingenuous to take something as unique as a mouth on the back of the skull and just turn that into an extra normal head. Going back to the drawing board, I decided to look into two-headed dogs to see what I could find. It was truly awful. So sometime around the 1950s, some Soviet dude named Vladimir Demikov, who was a pioneer in the field of organ transplantation, decided, for supposedly no reason, to graft a dog's head onto the back of another dog. Like, literally remove the body of one dog while keeping it barely alive, to then stick it on the back of another dog, just to see if he could, and they'd survive, which typically ranged from an hour to 29 days. He was doing this for years. Like, take the Galar fossils, but with real animals. Like, literally. Guy was like, hello, I cut puppy in half, stick to dog, very good. Yeah. No, this is not a joke. Yes, I am telling the truth. Also, I don't care if I pronounced his name wrong. The only pocket monster I see here is you, Vladimir. I didn't mean for that to rhyme. Of course, I didn't ask to be cursed with this information, so now I'm sharing it with you. You're welcome. Breeding Mawile and the Snubble Lion will result in Growl, a fairy dark type. I mean, how could this thing not be partially dark type with an origin like that? One of the dogs used in the experiments was a German Shepherd, giving Growl its color scheme. German Shepherds are also commonly used as working dogs, meaning that they'd be no stranger to wearing equipment. As a result, it almost looks as if Growl is wearing a backpack, but that is simply not the case. It has a whole extra head in its back, covered in fur and hidden from view, which it uses to surprise attack and ravage any unsuspecting opponent who underestimates its cute exterior. The extra mouth is not hostile by nature, and despite having two heads, the Pokemon thinks it's one. They love treats, walkies, and eating more than they can handle. Just like real dogs. I imagine that to evolve, they might need to use a certain number of biting moves. Perhaps even using each of them once? Or maybe having them consume, like, ten berries in one battle. Or something like that. Once the evolution criteria has been fulfilled, Growl evolves into K9. The evolution has sprouted an entirely new body and set of limbs, with the primary head swapping to the back, and the new alpha donning a sinister grin and massive, drooling tongue. Which there is a reason for, oh believe you me. Ivan Pavlov was a Soviet Russian physiologist who did a lot of experiments with dogs and getting them to salivate over food. Basically, the dogs began to drool whenever they heard the footsteps of the person who was going to feed them before they even got the food, as they had been conditioned to expect food by being given food every time this person approached. It's called Pavlovian conditioning. I'm not explaining the whole thing. I'm not your dad. What the heck was up with Soviets and dogs? Maybe any potential further evolutions or forms of canine could reference Laika the space dog, because why not? When in battle, while their backwards-facing head keeps lookout, it might also wave at you, the trainer, who it loves. I guess where Mawel is based on Japanese myth, the Growl line is based on Soviet science. Regardless of everything though, they're still really good boys. Haha, <laughs> sea slugs and nudie pranks are so cute and silly. Just look at them wiggle. There's debate as to whether Shellus and Gastrodon are actually nudibranchs or sea slugs, but like, to the common eye, all these squishy lads are the same. In the Water One and Amorphous Egg group, the Shellus lion shares this honor with Stunfisk and Pinkerton. If you know anything about me, you already know that Stunfisk is my favorite Pokemon. Gastrodon slaps, I mean it's used by Cynthia, and then there's Pinkerton, a Generation A Pokemon who just kind of exists. I feel like crossbreeding would be a cool way to give lesser appreciated mons a bit more of a spotlight. Maybe you're impartial to Snubble but really like Growl. Now, you actively need to find a Snubble to even get a Growl in the first place, helping you fill out the decks in the process. It's a win-win. So a uh, Sea Slug Sea Urchin. Well, there's a type of Sea Slug known as the Sea Hare. Hares look like rabbits, 
And Pinkerton's mouth has that classic ew ew energy. Gastrodon's got those ear looking things, so I don't think it's that much of a stretch. Zlug is an electric ground type. I'm a big fan of Mons with subversive typings. Sure, something based off of a sea hare could maybe be a water type, but just look at Inke and Malamar. Guys are squids, but are psychic dark type, and are usually found near water, but don't live in the water themselves. This cute little bun would be in a similar situation. Although I don't think typing should determine where a Pokemon can and can't live. If Zlug wants to live underwater, leave him off. It doesn't stop Delmise, Graplocked, or Clawbopus. Also, I asked my Discord members if they prefer another electric ground type or an electric water type, so it was a pretty unanimous decision to go with the former. Slugs and snails always have one weird fact that stuck with me growing up, that being that they only have one foot. Uh, ah, uh, you big one-footed freak! I decided to extend this to the forefront, giving Zlug the overall appearance of a bunny loaf. The urchin influence is mainly located in the butt area, similarly to a big fluffy bunny tail. Don't let this little cutie fool you though, one touch is enough to cause paralyzation. It can use its ears to defend itself, as they are tipped with retractable spikes, similarly to a cone snail. Sea slugs and nudibranchs are mostly venomous, after all. At level 30, Zlug evolves. While the first stage was definitely more rabbit influence, I wanted to lean into sea hair. While hare and rabbits are very similar, I personally find that hare are much less cute. They have like a big lanky energy to them. So as a result, so does Zabbit. Like the similarity between rabbits and hare, it's very similar to its pre-evolution, just with more chaotic energy. While Zlug will paralyze you, Zabbit will full on kill you. Well, look at you, you made it to the end. This is an idea that I had a ton of fun putting together. What was your favorite crossbreed? Would you have incorporated elements from the parent species differently to how I did? Let me know down in the comments. I'm genuinely interested to see what you guys thought. By the time that this video comes out and based on my trajectory, I imagine I'll have reached 30k subs. So just absolutely massive thank you to everyone. I appreciate it more than you guys can ever know. It's also been a hot minute since I've showed off some fan art, so thank you everybody for your submissions finally getting to show those off. If you'd like to keep up to date with when I upload, you can click the notification bell. I also have a Discord server, an Instagram where these crossbreeds will eventually end up, and Twitter, where my opinions go to die. As mentioned earlier, I also have a new Patreon, and massive thank you to my first ever patron, Joy, who helped me name most of these fakemon on a Patreon-exclusive channel on my Discord. Links to all of those and more are down in the description. Thank you all so much for watching. I've been Dead Bedspread, and all the best.